Welcome to the Guide to Making Money as a Music Producer. I'm Dan Furr, and this is a podcast where we talk about all the different ways that musical creatives have used to earn money. In this podcast, we hear stories directly from industry professionals and learn what worked for them and what didn't work. Most importantly, we discuss how they've managed to carve out a sustainable living for themselves doing what they love and how you can do the same. Hey everybody, Dan Fur here, and today I sit down with Jeff from Blut Productions. Now Jeff is a beat maker and producer, but most importantly, he's been recently getting into the music business side of things and helping a lot with artist development. And we talk about the idea of niching down. Now niching down is not a new term, it's one you may have heard before, but it's the idea of becoming a specialist in one specific idea or concept. And niching down can actually be a very effective strategy for turning a profit. But in this episode, we actually go over a couple of reasons as to why you might not want to niche down just yet. Thank you so much, Jeff from Blute Productions for for joining me. I'm very stoked to have you on board. I think this is going to be a very insightful episode for a lot of people, especially anyone who's you know looking to sell beats and and become a you know a traditional producer in that sense. Um, and so I guess to to just really get started, give me a little bit of a of a rundown and insight as to kind of how you made your first dollar in the in the industry and a little bit of a, a rundown and uh, just an overview as to you know where you are now and how you're currently making money now and just a little bit of the the path that you did from from start to finish and with with your music career. Okay. Uh, well, Dan, first off, I just want to say thank you for having me. Uh, I think it's a great concept you're doing here, and I'm glad to be a part of it, especially in the early stages. And um, yeah, so. Um, I've been playing guitar since about 2006. Um, and right around that time, I also started playing in a band pretty much immediately from the point I picked up a guitar. Um, so a lot of my first money that was made was from playing shows, uh, selling merchandise that kind of, or selling CDs, you know, back then we were burning CDs and, um, you know, streaming wasn't even a thing back then. Um, so that was like how we made a lot of our money at the beginning. Kind of the, the exhausting rat race that seems to be everybody's answer to this question. Yeah, you toured a little bit, didn't make a crazy amount of success, sold a little bit of merch here and there, and kind of maybe maybe made a little bit here and there, but you know, you're splitting that between the whole band and Yeah, you're now really I will not say as we got <laughs> as we progressed more and as our following built up, um, there was times where the, those ticket sales really did add up. I remember because, I mean, I handled most of the money in the band, especially. So the main band I was in was One Time Out, and that yeah. was probably from the end of high school. So we're talking like 2012 up until about uh, 26, no, 2018 is when I left the band. Um, but in that band, we had built up a pretty good following. And I remember there was one show that just at the door alone, we did probably like eight to $900 in sales on tickets. So there are definitely ways to make money in that if you can do it right. Like at that point, we had built up a relationship with um, some of the venues. So we're like, hey, we're going to throw a show here. You can take all the money from the bar. We're going to take all the money from the door and the tickets. And that was kind of like right. um, the, the the trade-off. So when you can build relationships with yeah. venues like that, um, that's really where the chance to make money is if you're a performing artist and that kind of stuff. So yeah, that, that's pretty much that on, yeah. on, on making... Nice. Money with shows and stuff like that in the or in the early days. Yeah. yeah. So how how about do you go making the the most of your money with music these days? Um, so these days it's a lot different. It's all pretty much for the most part part online. Um, so when I left the band in 2018, I'd already been doing Blue Productions for about two years. So I started in 2016, and um, I was just really enjoying that because I was connecting with people all over the world, um, selling beats to them. So yeah, I started online just selling beats. That was like all I really did at first um, was just selling beats to rappers. Um, and then as I started to realize like my graphic design skills could be of use, um, I started offering that um, up for um, a service so I could make money that way. Um, and then I, I just kept trying to like acquire more skills. So then I got really good with mixing and mastering. So I started offering uh, I did free mixing for a long time, and then I started actually charging people for it once I felt I was like good enough for it. Um, mm -hmm. So it started with just kind of like those basic three things um, for making money. It was just selling beats, graphic design, and uh, mixing, which I still do. I still do all of those three things, and I've now just found more ways to incorporate different uh, avenues of revenue. 
Yeah, and I think that's a very, very important point to, to sort of talk about because, you know, there's there's a very intense debate, I feel like, in, in a lot of professional settings as to, you know, what's the fine line between diverse, you know, diversifying all the skills you offer and niching down and having one focused skill. And I think, you know, the the real fine line between thinking about this 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 concept is, you know, niching down isn't something that you can do right off the bat right early. Well, it will be the best method to go overall to find one thing that you do the best and be the best at mm-hmm. that. That's a long-term strategy. To do that right from the bat, right, right off the beginning, it's it's very hard to get your foot in the door and kind of prove that, and it, you know, really get your network expanded in a way that you can actually get enough work to do that. So at the beginning, you know, diversifying your skills to be able to offer graphic design, to be able to offer, you know, mixing and mastering, and even you know, do a little bit of free work to kind of bring in a bunch of as many networked and as many people as possible, kind of allows you to you know, build up your portfolio. And also what it teaches you is it it allows you to realize what you're good at, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, in doing those things, you'll naturally realize what you're best at and what there's more of a need for and what there's more demand for. And, like, you know, it'll become very quickly that you'll you'll realize, well, I make the most of my money off of maybe just selling beats, therefore now I want to spend the bulk of my time selling beats and kind of, you know, maybe do a little bit less graphic design and do a little bit less free work. But, you know, you don't really know that until you, you know, dip your feet in a bunch of water and try a bunch of different things to know, you know, A, what you're good at and B, what there's actually a demand for. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I totally agree. And I think that's kind of helped what's point me in the direction of what I do now, which is, a lot more um, consulting and consultations and teaching people the business because I've spent so much time learning all these things that um, I realized that people also want to learn. And I was like, well, I can teach them. I, I've figured out yeah. how to set up a website. I figured out how to do the domain, the, um, you know, make the beats, mix the beats, do my own artwork, set up everything. I've always just been doing it solo. And since I've learned all these things, I'm like, why don't I just teach people how to do this stuff? Because, you know, the internet is a great place. There's so much resource out there for free, but it can also be overwhelming. There can be so much things. If you go down a YouTube rabbit hole, you'll be all over the place. And it's not in order of how like you might want to think, um, want things to be. So then you're just kind of like, what do I do with all this information? It almost becomes overwhelming. Um, so I like that, you know, if someone wants to come to me, like I'm going to structure it out so that we can, you know, take it step by step. Like, do you have a store yet? No. Okay. Let's start with, you know, that what's your producer name going to be? What's your artist name going to be? Like start at square one and work your way up. Cause, um, that's what I did. And I think some people get lost. So if I can help guide them in that way, um, you know, that, that'll be awesome. And that's just something I learned from doing all these all these different things and seeing what people needed help with. Yeah, and I think that's a, a very important thing because a lot of musicians, they're good at music, mm-hmm. right? They know, you know, a lot of them have been playing their entire life. You know, they're, they're maybe not a master at their instrument, but they've been playing a long time, long enough that they're very competent with their instrument. But what discourages a lot of people a lot of the time is the business and is that other side of things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's a very, very like pristine and fine example of, you know, you did a whole bunch of things and then what you kind of realized through this trial and error process of actually working with artists and musicians is that, well, their biggest struggle isn't necessarily the music side of it, it's the business side of it. How do they, you know, how do they, how, they, don't, they don't really know how to get a presence and, and create a brand for their, their music, and that's what sells these days. And so, you know, it, it, it really comes down to this concept of sort of thinking outside the realm of music and thinking, you know, music adjacent, like what skills are within the realm of music that a lot of musicians are, musicians are struggling with because, you know, like, like I say, there's extremely, there's so many amazingly talented musicians out there, but they, they seem to fall short because of reasons outside of music and, you know, finding that need that, you know, helping them with their branding and helping them with their business has allowed them to continue along that musical path and that, that they want to follow. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's definitely. just... I think that's just, yeah, like that's just a prime example of sort of discovering a need when that's not something that you set out to do from the get-go. You know, you set off to sell beats and then you kind of realize, well, I can do graphic design, I can do a little bit. And then after doing these couple things, what you realize is, well, the biggest need that I'm noticing isn't actually any of these things I'm doing. It's this new thing. It's it's this kind of, you know, branding and, and, and marketing coaching that a lot of people are, are really, or a lot of the people that you're working with really need help with. And, you know, again, like I, I just can't stress enough, it's a prime example of really just like, paying attention to your situations and being aware that this is what most people have a need for and this seems to be one of the bigger problems. And as soon as you can identify a problem, 
you can make money from that problem and you can profit off it as long as you have a solution to that problem. Yeah, 100%. And um, I think like what you said is like the music is never really the problem. I mean, some people might need to work and uh, work on their sound or their craft a little bit more. We all got to do that because we all started square one. Like yeah. I didn't always play guitar good. Yeah. I sucked for a lot of years. <laughs> I sucked at producing for a yeah. lot of years. I feel like the last like um, two, three years have really been the strong point of my beats and I've been doing it since 2016. So um, actually exactly. I've been really making beats since like 2010. So that's a long time I've been making music on the, on the computer. Yeah, it's a good decade and and yeah, like six or seven years before starting to feel competent with your beats kind of thing. Like that's not uncommon time yeah, frame. Exactly. Know? But um, so for me, um, the biggest thing I've noticed lately um, is really how to collect that money. Cause like I was saying earlier, you know, you printed CDs and that's how you, how you sold your music. You sold a CD for mm -hmm. five, 10 bucks. Maybe you gave them out for free. I don't know. But now we've moved into this digital era where it's Spotify, it's Apple music, it's Pandora, it's YouTube, it's content ID and all these things. And it's like, nobody really knows how to collect the, the money that's made off of this. And then all they end up yeah. seeing is there's no money to be made in this. And it's like, well, that's not actually yeah. the case. The thing is, and it's, it's confusing. And that, that, that <laughs> rhetoric, that rhetoric, it, yeah, it's so confusing. And that rhetoric is thrown around a lot between, you know, like, uh, like you look at just anything relating to streaming, there's just this huge conversation that, oh, artists are getting paid nothing these days. And when you look at it specifically through the lens of Spotify and Apple Music and streaming, well, you're right, they are making pennies on a diamond and next to nothing. But that's not the only avenue to be making money as a musician. In fact, it's the worst avenue, but it's the most commonly talked about avenue to make money as a musician these days. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, um, you know, it's it's very confusing. I spent like a solid probably six months reading and watching videos and really trying to figure out how people make money in the in the music industry. And I got to say, like, I mean, I don't know every industry out there, but to me, it's like the music <laughs> industry has got to be one of the most confusing industries out there, w without a doubt. Like, you know, between... <laughs> um, writer publishing and uh, publisher side of publishing. And then you have non-interactive stream royalties and you have master royalty streams. And it's like, um, it, it's a lot to wrap your head around. I was confused for months and I feel like I started to get a grasp oh, yeah. on it. So I was like, how can I teach other people to do this to show them like, hey, you can make money off streaming and getting your music out there on these streaming platforms. Um, and you can also sell your music directly. There's that streaming isn't the only way. So um, yeah, it's just a matter of showing them what the possibilities are. Yeah. So, so based on, on that, it kind of seems like, now correct me if I'm wrong, it kind of seems like the current niche that you're sort of leaning towards in, 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 in the near future and sort of where you're, you're kind of directing towards is, you know, more so teaching the biz, the business side of, of a musician and as, as a producer, is that <laughs> yeah. correct? And, and I mean, like I, yeah. I said earlier, I don't, I'm not the richest person out here. I'm not making a million bucks. I'm not driving a Tesla or Ferrari. I still work a day job. <laughs> But I know how to make money online, and I've learned a lot of things from about selling merch nowadays and how to actually do these streaming royalties. And it's like, you know, there's there's people that don't know this inf info and that could find value in it. So like, I have no problem teaching. Oh it. yeah, there's there's people I know that like their full time job is not even creating music, but just syncing music for other musicians, right? They like they they just sort of have a library of musicians that they work with, and they help them get that music synced or whatever. Like they're you know, music syncing on its own is a rabbit hole that you could talk about for you know, probably like 1,500 episodes alone in this series of all the different avenues about music syncing and how to license music and, and, and all the different realms about how to do that. And, and and yeah, like, you know, it's it's so easy to get caught in the loop of, oh, you know, I got, you know, pennies on my Spotify streams or whatever. But the whole music syncing and, 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 and licensing realm is very, very lucrative. But, but like you, you say, it's very, very confusing and kind of hard to get your foot in the door. But once you understand the systems and, and, and the structures of what it is, it's not overly that complicated in the grand scheme of things, but it's kind of hard to figure out how to do if you have, you know, you don't, it all comes down to you don't know what you don't know. And it's very hard to search this stuff up and be like, how do, how do I license music? How do I sync music? How do I figure it out? And there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of interesting companies out there that are kind of you know, they, they, they do things for you, but it's so hard to know what is going to be a good fit for you as far as syncing goes. And like that, that's an avenue that people have full-time careers just dealing with music syncing or whatever. And it's like, it just really opens the door that 
there are so many avenues, right? Spotify is just the one smaller avenue, but you know, from music syncing to, to selling beats to, produ- to producing and, and, and whatnot, like each one of those realms have so many different sub avenues and sub, sub, you know, elements to them that you can spend your entire life going down one of these specific things and it's still very confusing. But the more confusing something is, the more opportunity for profit there is, but that because that means there's less people figuring it out. True, and that is very true. And um, yeah, sync licensing is definitely a big one. I would say that's where a lot of the money is in the music industry. Um, yeah. I have yet to land a, a sync placement, but I'm actively, you know, um, sending out form and that kind of stuff. And um, I always yeah. like to say, like, you ever wonder why, like, you know, these these musicians you haven't heard of in years are still so rich and have all this money. And it's because, like, their songs are being played in the grocery store or in a movie or in a yeah. commercial. Like, how many times have you listened to a commercial and you hear the instrumental from a song that you know or something like that? And it's like they're making money off that every time that streams. Yeah, I mean, like, how many times How many times do you think the Bee Gees songs have been used for commercials, like, <laughs> in the past two or three decades, you know? Like, they're, they're still thriving on that market alone. And, and, and that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a very promising avenue because, you know, we're living in a day where there's way more content being created than ever before from video games to film to tv to podcast to youtube creation like there's just so much more content and, and stuff being created that there, there is a way bigger demand for music syncing and licensing than there ever has been and and you know the opportunities are there for people for music that you've already created and there's opportunities to create music specifically for syncing purposes and there there is the demand for it but it, again it all comes down to like you say it's a very confusing system that it's kind of hard to really just get your foot in the door. But once you do, it's very, very lucrative. Yeah, and um, I mean, one of the things I don't like about the music industry, and this is why it's very important, is that if you leave that money on the table for too long, it's going to go to the to someone else. So basically, with yep. publishing royalties, there's this thing called black, black boxing. And what happens is if you don't register your music, all that money that's being um, generated from your song streaming is going, these companies are collecting it and they're like, we don't know who to pay it out to. So they put it in this box and they're like, maybe someone will claim this. And after X amount of time, I forget, you can look it up. um, They're just going to pay it out to the top earners. So that means if you don't collect your royalties or if you don't register your songs, people like Drake, Ariana Grande, um, The Weeknd, all these big artists are going to end up with your money. So it's like, why give them the money when they already have the fan base? Like just, just register your stuff. And it's, that's why it's like, once you learn, it's really not that hard because we have all these different companies that are going to collect it for you. You just need to be able to register yeah. your song and say, hey, that's mine. This is my information. This is my account. And then they'll go, okay, let yeah. me go collect that for you. So it's, re- it's really not that hard. Yeah. It's not like you're the one knocking down doors going, hey, I need my money from this strong- song that was streamed. You've got people going out there for you doing that. It's like you have a team. Yeah, and, and but it all comes down, again, if you don't know what you don't know. And so if artists just don't know to do this, then they they will have no idea. And then their money will end up going to the Drakes and the Ariana Grandes because mm-hmm. they just don't know how to how to fix it otherwise. And it's yeah, like you say, it's a simple process, but if you don't know what you don't know, it's it can end up losing you money down down the road. And uh, and uh, and yeah, you know, I think you know I think licensing and syncing is definitely something that's worthwhile for anybody that's that, that's creating music you know like it does take a little bit of a while to learn the process mm-hmm. and fortunately what i'm going to do is i have a good buddy who he does a lot of music syncing and licensing who i'm going to have on in a future episode oh, awesome. and I'm, I'm really quite excited to have him because i'm going to be able to dive down in a little bit more specifics as to some of the tips and tricks he might be able to give us but i think i think that's an avenue that's going to be very i want to be very fairly discussed on this podcast through it in a number of different episodes because you know, it is fairly con- confusing, but like you say, it's one of the more lucrative opportunities to make money in in this industry, and so it's it's a very exciting it's a very exciting opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think yeah, learning the business is important, and that's kind of why uh, I've just shifted my focus towards that. Um, yeah. So so let me ask you, what do you think some of the most important and exciting things you did to align yourself to be this, you know, business coach or teaching people in the in the in the music industry? What do you think some of, were some of the biggest things you did that allowed you to kind of find this niche, find this avenue, and 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 find success in it? Um. Let me think here. So, I would say how I found myself here is just always been my. Um, I've just always been genuine and I've always wanted to like help people. So, you know, my friends are artists Mm -hmm. and stuff. And like I said, I've always had the need to like get out there and learn. And I've always been super driven um, to learn these things. So as soon as I like would be like, yo, 
this we can figure out this and we can get our music here. I'd be showing everybody that I could show because, you know, I want everybody else to to win too. You know, this is a lot of us we did it together. So it was like our team or it was like our band or whatever. So I'm like always teaching people the stuff that I would learn. So I think um, you know, all these years I've always had that. And I'm like, why don't I just focus on that? Like, um yeah. more so. But I think really what like got me here to being able to make money in music and stuff like that is like um you know, consistency is a big one, you know, cause it's, it's hard. You know, there are days I, I yeah. just yesterday, I was like knocking my head against the wall. Like this is tough, man. Um, but if you can just yeah. keep pushing forward, um, it, it's going to pay off for sure. It, it's one of those things that over the first two or three years, you're probably going to notice zero trajectory. Totally. You're probably going to notice zero path. But as long as you spend, you know, every day just doing one slight little bit of thing that, you know, will get you closer to to your goal or, or cl- closer to, to, thing, to, to where you want to be, as long as you kind of, every day you're doing something, whether it's like 10 minutes of practicing or 10 minutes of organizing or, or 10 minutes of just planning planning what your goals are, you know, as long as you do a little bit every day, consistently every day, you might not notice anything, you probably won't notice anything for the first year or two, but after three or four years, you'll start to notice that snowball taking over. And it's, you know, unfortunately in this industry, it's, it, it, it will take a couple of years. There's just no way around it. It, it, it is the consistent, consistency is everything in this industry. And, you know, it's, especially when you're dealing with, with, you know, social media as a tool for your brand and for your business, consistency, consistency is even more of a factor on that. And so, you know, you really just have to be present and, and consistently there, but it also, you know, it's all about that finding that balance as well, because there's one thing about being consistent and then burning out and then not doing anything for a month and then being consistent, right? That's not even consistent. Mm-hmm. That's just going through spurts and whatever else. So it's, you know, having a, a fine level of work-life balance is, is integral. And, 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 you know, like you say, working a full-time job on top of a lot of that stuff, like the only way to achieve that is to have a structured and strong work-life balance. And if I'm not mistaken, you're a dad, right? I am. Yep. I have a one-year-old daughter. Yeah. And so like, so that, you know, that even more so, like the work-life balance needs to be so integral and so in tune to be able to, you know, balance all of those things. That's, that's, that's so much time and so much need to be done. But, you know, here you are thriving and doing it. And like you say, there are some, some harder days and some tougher days, but you're, you're clearly still killing it and you're moving on. And, and, and it's very exciting to see, you know, like how, how possible and how probable it is to, to do this stuff. And just because you have a full-time job, doesn't mean it's out of the question, you know, it, there, it, you just have to do baby steps every day, every day, and then things will align as long as you have that consistency and that repetition towards it. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And it, like I said, it's not always easy, but I think if you're passionate about it and if you're really driven to go after it, then you're going to figure it out. Like, uh, you know, and there are some risks and some sacrifices that you're going to have to make. And I think that's a big one. Um, you know, I've, walked away from jobs to take other jobs. I've, um, I, I've risked putting stuff on the line just to, to try and, um, you know, get out there like, um, you know, taking a week off from work to, um, you know, drive out to California for a show or something like that, or taking a day off so that I can yeah. go help a friend with a music video, whatever it may be that I feel like is going to help take that next step. Um, and it's going to, it's going to be a little scary. It's going to be, uh, you're going to second guess yourself a lot. Um, but I think if you're, like I said, driven, you're, you're going to figure it out one way or another. Yeah. So essentially, I guess to the biggest things you did to put yourself in that position was kind of just really be as, as, as present as you can with a lot of your friends, help out whenever you found a problem with the solution, you kind of were, were willing to share that with as many people and really just help as many people as you knew that were struggling with similar problems as possible. And what that probably did was probably, you know, as everyone knows, Teaching reinforces knowledge. And so by you teaching a lot of these people a lot of these stuff, I guarantee that reaffirmed that knowledge in your brain and allowed it way easier for you to do it yourself and, and make a profit for yourself and and really kind of thrive with that knowledge rather than just kind of tacitly doing it a little bit, right? And, and you know, like, like I say, teaching completely, you know, reaffirms that knowledge way more. So I guarantee that definitely helped you in, you know, reaffirming your knowledge and, and reaffirming your brand. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's funny you say that because like, so my day job is doing tech support. And so, you know, I don't know everything about these headsets, but I know enough about these headsets to teach people about them and show them, hey, this is how you can do this. And the more I do it, the more I, I learn about this headset. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm just blazing through it. Um, and, yeah, and that's kind of that's kind of the nature for a lot of this industry, yep. right? At the beginning, you're not really going to know the bulk of it. And you're not going to understand a lot of it. But 
And it's going to take two or three years before you even start to notice the understanding of a lot of the bulk of it and finding that growth. But just doing a little bit every day, day in and day out, even if it's hard, you know, if you're not feeling musically inspired, maybe you don't have to do something musical, but kind of do a little bit of organizational or do a little bit of goal planning or just do something a little bit every day. Listen to a podcast. You know, the, what you can do can be pretty minimal. Yeah. Like, you know, like literally listening to a podcast when you go on a walk. But as long as you're doing something every day to further yourself towards the goal, that's, you know, that's valuable. And I guess the really important thing about this as well is to kind of have those goals, be measurable, kind of know what you want. And those goals can be flexible, but as long as you, you know, if you don't have goals, it's going to be very hard to know that at the end of the day, you did something that's going to better you towards those goals. And, and again, I, like I say, those goals can be flexible and they can be fairly vague, but the more direct and, you know, objective your goals are, the easier they are going to be to measure and start to find that success that you're looking for. And so, you know, having a good goal plan and and working every day to try and meet those goals is really the only way you're ever going to make anything or or make it anywhere because it it really does take that two to three years of commitment and doing something every day to really get that momentum going. Definitely, definitely. And, um, you know, like I think think we beat beat ourselves up a lot because – you know, we look at Instagram or we look at the social medias and we just see people doing stuff all the time, but we don't see the in-between stuff. We just see their content yeah. from one post to the next, but there might be weeks in between those posts. There might be days in between that post, months even, um, that you don't see. So I think we beat ourselves up and being like, man, I got to make a beat every day, man, I got to, I got to do yeah. this every day. And then you just burn out. Um, and it's like some days it's like I might not even do music. I might just sit on the couch and play with my daughter. I might watch a YouTube video that, hey, I just learned how to um, – I figured out I could do streaming from my phone or something like that. Like, um, hey, I just found out you can make money um, off Instagram. And just that knowledge right there is growing your possibilities. So, um, you know, you don't have to make a beat every day. You don't have to mix a song every day. You don't have to write a song every day. As long as you're – showing interest in what it is you want to do every day that's what's important right. yeah consistency consistency doesn't necessarily mean to need to mean do the exact same thing every yes, day exactly. but it just means you know do something that is going to further your your progression of your goals every day and and they they can be completely different tasks but as long as those tasks in some way line up to what your main goal and main vision is you'll you'll get to that vision in one way or another yeah exactly and like you're going to have days where you're uninspired and i might just go on youtube and watch you know, RMC Beats or Crackalack. I might watch those dudes just do what they do and that's going to inspire me. And it's like, as long as you put thought into your passion every day, that's all that matters. That is all that matters every day. And you're going to yeah. get there. And, you know, the next day you might crank out a beat. You might crank out five beats. The day after that, you might learn some more info. The day after that, you might learn a new skill. Like, it's going to be different yeah. every day. And that's what keeps it fun. And I think, um, you know, to go back to the point earlier where I was saying I learned all these different skills, that's what's kept the whole thing interesting these past like four or five years is like, you know, it, it, sometimes it's hard to stay consistent with just selling beats every month. You're going to have bad beat months. And, um, you know, yeah. the, the months that I'm not selling beats, I'm usually doing graphic design. And then when I'm not doing graphic design, I might be mixing. And so, yeah. you know, I get consistent work because I'm just jumping from one thing to the next. And some people might say, oh, that's bad. You got to find your niche. Um, well, my niche is that people can come to me for whatever they want. You know, um, yeah. so, you know, play it how you feel is going to work best for you. Some people might only want to focus on beats and that's fine. Some people might only want to focus on writing. That's fine. Um, some people might want to do 10 things as long as it's not like two out there. Like you have those people, they're like, um, what's like, what's like a funny example I saw on like TikTok or something like that, where they're just like, um, you know, I'm a dancer, singer, actor, rapper, philanthropist, like all these different things that just yeah. like don't even entrepreneur director. Yeah, that just yeah. don't add up. And you're like, well, okay, you're like way too far. Like everything I do yeah. helps artists and producers. That's like it's in, the it's realm. in that yeah, and- kind of uh funnel triangle, whatever you want to call it. Um it's close yeah. by. Yeah. And it, it all comes down to like there's no one way to do things, no. right? Nishing down is a great effective strategy for a lot of people. Like it but like I was saying earlier, it's a very hard strategy to come off the ground and hit the ground running, you know, niching down is as as narrow and as focused as some people do. And that can end up hurting you off the get-go, especially for a lot of people, because 
you know, you're just narrowing your, your the, the amount of people that will hire you and you're not very well known. So there's not a lot of people in that specific niche that might want to hire you kind of thing. And, and so, you know, there's no wrong way to do things. You know, niching down is a great strategy, but diversifying your skills is a great strategy. And, you know, what's a great example in this is through diversifying your skills, that's what allowed you to niche down. Mm -hmm. Had you just focused on niching down as a beat maker or producer, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have been able to niche down as this, you know, music business coach. And from diversifying your skills, that's what allowed you to find your niche, right? So there's there's no one way to do things. There's all sorts of different ways to 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 to, to diversify your business and niche down. There's 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 just no one way to do it. And 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 different ways can can find success. It's just all about being smart and like like we were saying before, continually working towards those goals day in and day out and being consistent with your progress. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. you know, um, one thing that's done well for me is my guitar loop packs, uh, because I've been playing guitar for almost 16 years. Um, I've, I've developed a good skill and a lot of people really like my loops and, uh, they do well when I put out new packs and I could spend every other day just cranking out guitar loops if I wanted to. I love playing the guitar, but I have a lot of interest and I don't only want to play, play the guitar. Like I don't want to niche down that hard to that's the only thing I do. Yeah, and that just comes down to exactly what this show is all about, right? It's all about finding a modest living in music that you are happy with. And diversifying your skills is one way for you to get much more satisfaction out of doing this. And that's at the, that's at the end of the day is what it's all about. You know, we're all doing this to enjoy our lives and love what we do. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing this just to make money and you start to get stagnant and don't enjoy what you're doing, then you're not going to make it very far. The second you start getting exhausted and don't enjoy what you're doing in this industry... You're, you're just not going to make it because there's so many people that absolutely love what they're doing and that's going to show in their work. And so, you know, diversifying has sort of allowed you to enjoy enjoy all your different roles and enjoy working in the industry way more than specifically focusing on one thing otherwise may have, have done for you. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, that's, yeah, pretty much it. Cool. Um, so I guess... Uh, I guess I just uh, I want to ask this little bonus question here. What what's the most exciting project you think you've worked on over the past uh, you know basically in your entire life? And uh, I get the feeling there's going to be a wide range of projects, so it might be a little hard to change give, or choose given all your <laughs> all your different expertises. But uh, what's kind of the most zanious or random or exciting project that you think you, you you've worked on? Oh, okay. Um, or just most exciting as well, something that you know really appeals to you. Yeah, I mean. Um, you know, I've done a lot of stuff that I think is cool. Um, I think the coolest for me is just the, to be able to say that I've I've opened up for bands like um, Buck Cherry and Candlebox, uh, Nonpoint, Steven Tyler. I think the coolest thing was I played Laconia Fest in 2016. Um, we opened up for it was two days that we played. It was a week long festival. Uh, the first day we opened up for Buck Cherry, and the second day we opened up for Steven Tyler and Godsmack. And that was on like this giant 50 foot stage um, <laughs> with like a pretty decent crowd. So it was at um, yeah. it was at Bike Week in Laconia. And anyone that might be from like New Hampshire or motorcycle fanatics are gonna know what Bike Week is. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the smaller Daytona, but uh, it's still pretty popular. We've been running for probably years. Yeah. decades at this point but yeah. so and I grew up going to that bike week because my whole family rides motorcycles so to be able to grow up and then play that oh that's really um, cool yeah play at bike week in a great festival like that was probably one of the coolest things I've done that is yeah that is super cool yeah that, that would be an experience without a doubt Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, with, with that being said, I want to thank you so, so much for, for coming on this show. I think, I think this was a very insightful episode. I think there's going to be a lot of cool things that are, that are going to be very valuable in this. Um, where can people go to learn a little bit more about you or potentially hire you for some mixing or some business coaching or, or yeah, where, where can people go to learn a little bit more about you? Um, so you can go to my website, uh, bloopbeats.com. That's where basically all of my, um, services, beats, merchandises, um, you can also find me on Instagram at blue productions. Um, that's probably where the easiest place to get in contact with me is cause I'm usually always on there networking with people. So if you send me a message there, um, you'll probably get a quicker response. Um, or you can just shoot me an email blueproductions at gmail.com. That's another way, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And Dan, I thank you for, uh, you know, having me on. It's been a lot of fun. I think, uh, I think a lot of people will hopefully learn something from this call and, uh, <laughs> take away from it that's the goal yeah that's that's the exact goal yeah so thank you so much for coming thank you so much for your time i had a blast chatting and uh and yeah i hope you have a good one you too man i hope we can do this again sometime <laughs>